SBC Media. Welcome to Behind the Badge, the podcast from SBC Sponsorship and Insider Sport, discussing the latest approaches to sport sponsorship. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Badge podcast, where we go off the field to discuss what is at the heart of sports leagues and clubs' brands. On today's episode, we fly over to the Maple Leaf country of Canada and the world of rugby as we welcome Director of Digital Strategy at the Toronto Arrows, Alex Borthwick. Alex, thank you for taking your time out today to speak with us. Uh, how are you doing today? Yeah, very well. And thank you for, for having me. Hopefully, I'll have some, uh, some good insight here. I'm sure you will, mate. No, no, I'm sure, yeah. And uh, as ever, I'm joined by my, uh, as you can hear there, my co-host, George Harbond. How are you doing today, George? I'm all right, thanks, mate. How are you getting on? I'm not too bad, mate. I'm not doing too bad. But Alex, it's good, to, it's good to have you on, mate. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me as well. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll jump straight into it as well, Alex. You've, uh, you've moved into the world of rugby, having worked at, um, I believe you even worked with George at Aston Villa. So tell us about that transition just from moving from football to rugby and especially rugby in Canada as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, they couldn't really be more worlds apart, to be honest with you. Um, you know, and, and I think that George and I were both very fortunate working at Aston Villa because we were given a little bit more freedom possibly than other um than other clubs would have when they're kind of in the Premier League. Um, you know, we had you know, relatively big budgets, I guess, uh, to, without putting a number on it. Yeah, probably yeah, probably exactly. too big. You know, we had we had pretty good um, we had we had a pretty good team. So I think we had probably probably three specifically on the marketing team. We had three designers. We had three video editors. We had two social media managers. We had a lot of people. It was a big team. Um, and I think we did a lot of good work back in those days as well. Um, and then, yeah, I guess the opposite end of the spectrum with the arrows. So we're effectively a startup. So we operate at the startup. Everything is driven by revenue or profit. Um, everything is looked at in kind of minute detail. How is this going to drive the result? How is this going to drive tangible return? Um, I... Well, I have a couple of people reporting to me now, but not specifically to do with digital or, or marketing. It's more, I guess, the older I get, the more experience I have, and uh, that kind of puts you at the top of the pile. Um, you know, we don't really have budgets per se. Everything is kind of very stringently looked at by the owner. Um, if I can convince him that something is worth doing, then we'll do it. Um, but as it's not a huge amount. I don't know. I don't know if I should say this, but I'm going. To, not a huge amount of planning goes into what we're going to spend next season. It's more. Let's look at what we're doing at the time, because I mean, if you imagine you're kind of spinning five plates at one time, and one of them is generating revenue, you focus on that one, and yeah. so it's let's see how this goes. Let's see how this campaign works. And if it works, then we're going to put all of our eggs into that basket. If it doesn't, we're just going to throw that plate away and we're going to work on that something else because that really has to be the driver for everything we're going to do. So I was just going to say, I think I think what you just said there isn't dissimilar to some of the stuff we did at Villa, though, because we would, you know, because what, what essentially you're talking about there is, is testing stuff, learning from it, and going doing it again. And now, admittedly, the resource that you have you know, in, in, in UK football is going to far outstrip the resource that you've got in, in, in Canadian rugby at the moment because because it's in that growth phase. But we still did a lot of that, even even in those environments where we would try something, if it worked, we'd focus efforts on it. I know there was more structure to it and it had to be because the costs were so much were so much higher. Um but it's not it's not a million miles away, right? That's how you that's how you get a better as an organization. Yeah, absolutely. I so I was actually just gonna say the fundamentals and the principles of how we do things are exactly the same. And I mean, where, yeah, where it kind of, kind of differs is the, I guess, the size of the campaigns that you're running, um, the amount of people that you're marketing to, the audience that are, dare I say, interested in what you're trying to market to them, um, yeah. is, is where it differs. But the principles are very much the same. Like, I, I always say this when, there's only one man city that can afford to throw money at everything and see what sticks. And when it does stick, you put all your eggs into that basket. But but in in this kind of instance, it is similar in the sense that, you know, you very much analyze data 
you see who your audience are, you tailor content or you tailor ads to fit that market or fit that audience, I should say. And then you just build and you refine, um, having learned what does and doesn't work. Um, so, so there are definitely fundamental principles that overlap, but it's, it's just on a, on a very different scale. Yeah. Sorry, Alex, as well. You know, also in Canada as well, I mean, it's rugby is obviously, you know, it isn't of the likes of, let's say, ice hockey or, you know, even um, even basketball as well. Now I know the Toronto Raptors are quite big over there. Um, but I, there's also a great opportunity there to to stand out from those sports. Have you identified any key areas of how to make rugby stand out from the rest of its comp- competitors? Yeah, that's a really good point. So um, when you don't have an audience, and this is what I kind of touched on earlier, not sort of being in the Premier League and being in the limelight enabled us to do a lot of interesting things that maybe we were given a little bit more freedom both internally and then probably a little bit more leeway from the fans to buy things differently. And and it's no different in Canada. You've got a lot less people kind of looking at you. So you can be a bit more daring and a bit more um, out of the box if you're thinking um, because... The, the the bottom line is not so many people are going to be affected by things if they go wrong. Um, so so there is opportunity to to kind of do things a little bit different. Um, one of the advantages that we do have, and you may disagree with me on this, but I think no one does sport like North America, and so we're surrounded yeah. by prime examples of innovation and fan engagement and fan interaction and if we don't you know follow their example then we're, we're mad um so, yeah. so there is that perfect opportunity to utilize the expertise around us and just follow what works yeah i think you are you know you are in that territory you know not just kind of widely north america but also Ontario as well with some of the teams that are, that are kind of on your doorstep the innovation that exists there is and and some of the, the bits and pieces I've seen is really strong which I guess then increases that level of competition you know it's great to be able to learn from them but then you've also got to cut through that as well absolutely and actually I should caveat that by saying we're in a little bit of a trickier situation because if you take hockey if you take basketball they're indoor sports right and so you're in an arena um, the, the, I, do, I guess you have different stoppages in play. So if yeah. where soccer and rugby are similar is you have pregame, you have half time, and you have post game. You don't have timeouts. You don't have quarters. You don't have thirds. And so there's a lot fewer chances to interact and engage with your audience when you're in a traditional kind of stadium outdoor sport. Um, so the, really, you know, we've got those sports that we can look at and how they do that. But they have many more touch points with their audience and with their fans who engage them, whereas we really just have pre, halftime and post. Um, so looking very closely at what MLS teams do there um, is is a really good example to follow, and it, it enables us to at least have one kind of blueprint that we can look at. You just need to sign Lionel Messi then, right? You know, they did the rugby version of of Lionel Messi. <laughs> that's just it. And I mean, like, th- that's the other thing, right? So you can say that one player on a basketball team makes a difference. So whoever's got the first pick in the draft is likely to have a very good season. And sorry, I, I'm, I shouldn't talk on this like on some kind of expert in American sports, North American sports, because I'm definitely not. But one player doesn't make a team. Um, oh, so you would have thought until the OMS went into the MLS and proving all of us wrong. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, in rugby, I can't even think of an equivalent. Maybe John and I moved back in the back in the mid nineties, but um, yeah, like unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. We actually have a draft um, for Major League Rugby, and these are guys coming out of North American colleges, and you know more often than not it's going to take them a good season or two to actually catch up with the with the standard uh it's just not the same yeah i think just just moving kind of from off the pitch because we've kind of covered that off a little bit to on the pitch and you know developing a game because that's what you're doing right you're not just competing in rugby 
in Canada and, and in Major League Rugby across the US states as well. You're developing a sport. You are kind of the flag in the ground in Canada for uh, for rugby union. So from a from an on the pitch perspective, and and I guess engaging with grassroots, building player pathways, and all that sort of stuff. You know, the stuff that ultimately grows participation. Have you, have you been finding that like, and what how does that link into kind of I guess some of the marketing initiatives that you might have? Yeah, I mean, again, really good question. Be. Uh, the one thing I will just say is obviously being being the only Canadian team in the league, we're kind of a, a loner anyway, like naturally. Um, it's we, We're not in the same position that all of the American teams are because there's 11 American teams and there's one Canadian. Actually, I may even have those numbers wrong. Maybe it's 12. There's 12, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, George, for the knowledge. So, we, um, so, so we're a... Com- we're a com- complete anomaly anyway. Um, so everything, what what the owner is trying to achieve from a Canadian rugby perspective, and I hope he doesn't mind speaking on his behalf, but um, is developing a pathway for those players to achieve professional rugby in their own country. So when you, so uh, high schools in Canada, they do play rugby, not all of them, but some of them do play rugby. And so, what what was happening previously, you finish high school, you go to university, that's the end of your rugby career. So maybe you really enjoyed it. You're an average player. Um, and I would just say that college with university rugby in Canada is not on the same kind of level as uh, college sports in, in America. It's very, very different. So what he's trying to develop here is a, a pathway so that young players you have talent from the age of I don't know, let's just say 16 upwards don't have a finite career like there is a next step after high school or after yeah. university and your next step is the Toronto Arrows um, the other advantage that we have and actually it would probably be more beneficial if there was maybe one other is the familiarity that players will then have with each other as they make that step from Toronto Arrows into the national. So I think, and and I'm sure that someone listening, if, if people listen to this, uh, will correct me when I'm probably going to give an in, incorrect information here. But I would say that when Canada played Tonga, I think it was 11 of the 23 were Toronto Arrows players. And yeah. what that means is you start developing like parents, you know, in FIFA Ultimate Team, where you want to have those connections between your left back and your centre back and your goalkeeper and your and your right back. I love the reference. Yeah, there you go. Uh, this is all round sports knowledge, pals. So basically, you know, your scrum half and your number eight and your fly half are all familiar with each other because they play for the Arabs. Your second row and your hooker know each other, so they know when to time their jump and line up because they play with each other day in day out. Yeah. Um, so that is what you're trying to tr- trying to achieve, and therefore hopefully strengthen the national team. So the, the, the model was proved by um, his name's Ben Darwin. So he used to be a front rower for the, for the Wallabies. Um, he has his own own company now called Game Line Analytics. As a little shout out for him, and what he has discovered through analysis and data and sports science was the model that the Scottish team, so the Scottish national team, is enjoying. Like his best success in what a decades, um, I think that's fair to say. And yeah. the basis of that success can be, in some way, attributed to the fact that there are only two professional teams in Scotland. So you've got Edinburgh and you've got Glasgow. So if you're a professional player, your pathway is to one of those two teams who compete in the URC. Uh, and what that did is obviously create cohesion, familiarity. It created patterns. And therefore, it could be deduced that that is what is leading to the success of the Scottish national team. Um, so it's very interesting anyway. And that's obviously what we're trying to or hoping will be recreated in the Canadian um, rugby landscape as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Brings on, it brings that familiarity and, you know, that, that strong cohesion. Yeah, that's it? really interesting. I think that could possibly help in burden on the, the team as well. Um, and also moving into more of a... Uh, Obviously, more of a betting betting landscape uh, with deals. Uh, I know Toronto Rose did a recent deal with Cool the Cool Bet, 
it did it, it, it no it delivered some some media value for uh, for the for the brand. What uh, what can you tell us about that deal and how how fruitful is betting partnerships over in uh, Ontario? What is it like in terms of of sponsorship deals? Yeah, absolutely. To be totally honest with you, it's it's been a, it's been a little bit um, gray. Uh, we we had that front of share sponsorship, or I guess you would call it a title sponsorship with with Coolbet for two years. Uh, the first year was a bit of a disaster because we moved our whole operation from Toronto to Atlanta during COVID. And so none of our media team were actually there. So it was very difficult to activate and execute on that partnership. Uh, cool Bear were very good and they came back a second year, which was um, very kind of them. Um, po- when possibly we didn't perform that well on the partnership. Um, what what we were able to do with using a using a platform called Relo Metrics, which is very similar to your kind of Nielsen focuses very much on digital, was um, basically over deliver on in terms of media value for the for the partnership. Um, where we struggled, uh, and I don't think this was necessarily a Toronto Arrows struggle, it was probably a combination of both parties, um, is proving the uptake in customers or the uptake in, in betting. Um, from our fans specifically. So where we um, had kind of difficult conversations with them was that, you know, they're kind of saying to us, well, look, there was no major bump in people betting on rugby specifically during our partnership, which I probably could have told them before the partnership started. Uh, In my experience, betting fans, and this is obviously not what I lead with in partnership conversations with betting companies, but rugby fans, in my experience, aren't necessarily um betting on rugby uh they i could i could very much estimate that they are betting on sport but rugby would probably be secondary or tertiary sport that they're actually betting on and the same would apply in the canadian market you know a rugby fan in canada is a rugby fan probably second they're probably a hockey fan first or or a basketball fan and so if they are betting, they're probably going to be betting on those sports because there's just more to kind of play with, um, if that's the right phrase. And so we had difficult conversations and what we were trying to do was um, use attrib- attribution and sort of say, well, you know, what, let's, let's look at customer acquisition and then let's look at attribution tracking and how we can actually deduce that rugby fans are betting. It just may not be betting on rugby. So... So we had some difficult conversations. I think the partnership was was an effective one, and I think that we can definitely prove value to betting partners. We know, for example, that rugby fans, uh, well, particularly Toronto Arrows fans, are uh, over-indexed in terms of engagement um, on, our, on our digital and social channels. Um, and I stand by the fact that we can help drive them where we want them to go because they do actually pay attention in this. I suppose as well, you, you, with Toronto Arrows being on the only rugby team at the moment in Canada, you kind of provide that unique platform in a sense as well. Like we are the only rugby team in Canada, and this is kind of almost we've got a nice position here now to maybe you know stir on that type of visibility, maybe whether it's through betting partnerships or you know other mediums as well. Well, exactly, and that's kind of conversations that I've been having with George and some kind of introductions that he's made is that between us and. Uh, the Canadian national team, you can own rugby in Canada, like nationwide. It's not just Ontario. It's not just Toronto. This is rugby nationally. Uh, we obviously have very close relationships with uh, Rugby Canada. Um, and as as you say, the, the, the audience is highly engaged. The audience have money to burn. I mean, you know, as much as anyone does in this day and age. Um sure. And and there are there are options for rugby betting available, it, but I don't think that that needs to be the be all and end all of a partnership. Is getting rugby fans to bet on rugby? Let's think about what else that they yeah. bet on. Yeah, definitely. I think you made a really good point there, Alex. Like the attribution thing for me, and we look, we experienced this at Aston Villa, and 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 I've experienced it at other clubs that I've worked at. The attribution piece um, isn't sometimes as fruitful and as direct as, as people maybe would perceive it to be. I think the where what sport offers and certainly what the Arrows offer in Canada is a platform to create a different narrative to what everyone else is talking about. 
and in a market that's incredibly difficult and noisy to cut through at the moment because of the amount of entries that are going into into Ontario, um, working with the Arrows and being able to, you know, engage with the community, engage with the sport, speak passionately with with sports fans, irrespective of whether they're a huge rugby fan or not, there's still there's still highlight real moments that will come from an Arrow season that people will want to consume throughout the course of the year. Um, you know that 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 gives credibility and, um, yeah, like I said already, a platform to to engage with people from. And I think that's the benefit of not only that, but you know, there's a whole piece of you, like you said earlier on, that's kind of startup mentality, the arrows startup mentality of, I guess, rugby union in the country. Somebody coming in and supporting something like the arrows, the that the money that comes in from that partnership goes directly into developing the club developing the sport developing the game supporting the community initiatives that you've got so it's something that you know a partnership with you guys genuinely moves the needles for you guys and in return you can genuinely connect them with a passionate fan base whereas that isn't always the case in some sports organizations where they're just so big so rich you know the money that comes in doesn't touch the sides and I think about kind of Premier League right you know you get so much money from broadcast revenue that if somebody was to spend half a million dollars uh at a, at a Premier League football club you you don't touch the you don't even pay for one player for a whole season right it just it doesn't it doesn't move the needle but um you know but obviously with the arrows it, it absolutely does I suppose you've also got the the rugby world the rugby world cup is it in a well, the next World Rugby World Cup, can you remind me again? Sorry, I went to 2031. Yeah, so that, I mean, there's some way away in there, but I mean, that could be a really, really great platform if, I mean, obviously, if Canada qualify, that's all, but uh, that could be really be a great platform for, like we've just discussed in the whole podcast, that, that grassroots level, that, uh, you know, spurring those type of players and inspiring the younger generation and then obviously yeah. engagement as well within the uh, with the whole country. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the Rugby World Cup is is going to be really key, and this is why Major League Rugby is around now. It's about building those foundations so that there will be a legacy after that World Cup, and you can kind of ride off the back of the, I guess the the waves of positivity around rugby following the Rugby World Cup, provided that Canada and the US qualify for it. Uh, well, obviously the US will qualify for it by being the host. Uh, yeah, so obviously we have um, a, a kind of increased level of accessibility for for our at our events, and so our players after a game they will come into an area that we call the garden, which is effectively a load of food and alcohol tents, um, and they will stand around for a good hour, hour and a half after a game, mingling with that. And so the accessibility and the level of interaction that we can offer to these partners is something that's way above anything else. Um, yeah. Aside from maybe, you know, where you get five or six of your first team players at Aston Villa to go into a, a box after a game, um, this is the whole squad and they'll be eating a meal and they'll be drinking a beer. Um, and so the kind of interaction and the engagement that we can bring to these partners is much higher. And as you mentioned, George, we're probably going to have 10 partners, 10 to 15, ideally. And so we can actually service those partners at a much kind of higher level um, because it is meaningful to us and it does make a difference. And we want to make sure that we can bring those partners back. And so we will always over deliver in terms of value where we can, obviously. Um, to achieve kind of meaningful business goals for these partners as well. I just want to kind of ask one last question, and it links back to um, uh, the betting market in Ontario. One of the big challenges, and I don't know how you found it during the Colbert partnership and and, and moving forward with the, some of the conversations that you're having, one of the big challenges is around the inducement piece, right, when you're trying to activate partnerships and and, and kind of tiptoe around that, around that whole play. Um have you found that so far and, and kind of, you know, has that been a challenge for you guys? Yeah, I mean, we, we had a uh, long conversation with a, with a betting, um, potential betting partner recently. And it was kind of like the conversation was a weird one because it was, can we do this? No, you can't do that. Okay, can we do this? 
no, you can't do that. And so in the past with Corbett, I think it was much more, it wasn't so black and white. Uh, and dare I say it, slightly less regulated. It was more of a, let's see what we can do within reason. And obviously with prior knowledge of how you market a betting or an alcohol partnership, for example. Yeah. Um, and until we're told otherwise, then, then we'll see what we can do. Whereas now, from from that conversation, I understand that it's very much the opposite. It's don't do anything um, because assume that it's not allowed. Now, I would hope, given, I guess, the um, how advanced the UK market is, that that will then ease over time. But it, it's a case of this is really new and we need to be really careful about how we do this. Um, so, so yeah, there were absolutely challenges, but I actually think it's possibly going to get worse before it gets better. Um, but it's just a case of we have to make sure that we tick all of those boxes when we're marketing to those people. Once we get people on board, then we just have to go, you know, go nuts on how you market them and yeah. really, really think outside the box as to how to, I guess, retain them and then convert them. But equally, once you have them, that we kind of have free reign to offer them incentives to bring more people in. So you get that one person across the line. Now they're in and they've agreed and they have ticked all of the boxes of their over 19, et cetera, et cetera. And then you start offering them incentives to actually bring their friends across and start betting on this platform as opposed to that platform. Uh, that's where we can start offering you know, rewards. So we can look at signed merchandise. We can offer them VIP experiences. Um, but yeah, the the whole inducement play is going to be a this going to be a real nightmare. To get. Yeah. Um, to to the extent where I was told the other day, you can't even approach someone and mention any kind of betting without them approaching you first. So, for example, if I'm representing a um, a sports book, I wouldn't be able to approach anyone, but I could stand there, and if someone approached me and asked me about it, then I could talk. To them. So. I mean, how they're going to police that, I have no idea. But that's the kind of. I level. think it's. I agree. I think it's going to be difficult to police. But I also think that actually, it makes partnerships with people like the Arrows even more important because you have to genuinely create connections. Um, you have to put yourself in the in the shop window as a brand because you can't just go out and punt out those those offer emails that we see in the UK market, which again. It's probably worth saying, Alex, are, are, are on the decline in you know rapidly, you know, with with some of the changes in rules that have, that have taken place over here, and are just generally kind of, I don't know, like the the public perception of the industry to some extent when it comes to sponsorships and the net, some of the negativity around announcements that, that have taken place in the UK. I think clubs are far more conscious now of connecting in the right way with fans rather than it being that old school kind of. You know, deposit ten pound, get this, or deposit the open an account and be in be in this draw. So, in many ways, yeah, it is challenging. But I think it I think it actually creates an opportunity for you to develop more meaningful connections and relationships between you and an operator, and then operators and and fan bases. Alex, we really do appreciate you taking the time out to speak with us today. Been a great episode. Cheers, George. Cheers, Alex. No worries. Thanks for having me, guys. SBC Media.